real quick, just to make sure we dial it in for the next round. And then make sure you guys are practicing this because your adjustments are predicated on your ability to find a restriction. So you need to be in a good posture, good position, good patient position to execute that properly, all right? So we'll talk about SC joint on the right side. I'm just gonna show it on one side. I'm gonna show the full series straight, straight through, okay? So make sure you guys are remembering that. When we do our I to S glide for the SC joint here, arms always resting at the side, position yourself behind the patient so you can block the body, stabilize that, just take our contact in the front. Find that super sternal notch, find the medial border of the clavicle, everything's predicated off that. I want to be I to S, so I'm inferior. My thumbs and the tissue slack from I to S, I'm going to drape over the patient's body here, try to drop my elbow below my contact hand, come I to S, and range, and feel. I'm still on that medial border of the clavicle, but now I go superior. So I'm superior medial, grab the patient's elbow, relax the arm for me, slowly bring it up past 90 degrees to about 100 degrees, elbow up, now I'm going straight down S to I. Okay, and range and feel. A to P glide. I'm going to shift my thumb so I'm now on the anterior surface of the medial clavicle, bring it forward, brace the patient again, push A to P. Again, my elbow should be in front of my hand because I'm pushing back towards me, A to P. Take that and range and feel. Leave the arm here, slide behind the patient's clavicle. We're good there. Bringing back into horizontal extension here. Bring my elbow back, turn the thumb forward, push P to A and range and feel. M to L to L to M. I can switch contacts. Dr. Smith likes to push. You can use thenar or hypothenar. I'm going to use hypothenar, coming in here, dropping underneath, brace against the patient here, and I'm going to push M to L. As I push to end range, notice the arm's going to come with me just a little bit here. I'm not cranking that arm and that torso. Everything's just kind of moving, and range, and feel. This forearm, I'm blocking the opposite shoulders to keep everything nice and stable, okay? L to M, Dr. Smell's going to switch hands because again, he likes to push as opposed to pull. Find that same medial border by the supersternal notch. Now I'm going to tissue slack from L to M to get close to that joint line. And I'm going to switch to a thenar contact because I don't want to cup them in the jaw right here. Thenar contact, I'm going to take tissue slack from L to M, reinforce, switch my body position. So now when I push here, still stabilize that shoulder, push L to M, notice the arm follows along with me, and range and feel. And that's our seated series for the SC, okay? AC joint, I to S, S to I. Palpate on the superior aspect of that clavicle. Find it all the way to the end. In the back here, I can find the superior angle, excuse me, the, spot, the root of the spine of the scapula. Find that spine of the scapula, take it all the way to its end. There's a little divot right here. That little notch represents the most posterior side of the clavicle. And I can find the joint line sort of right next to that. So I need to be right here. So if I'm going I to S, I'm coming underneath with my tissue slack, scooping underneath. Thumb on the chromium, stabilize that arm, come under the clavicle, pull up, I to S. Okay. S to I, still on that joint line, but now I'm just on the superior aspect of the clavicle. Thumb pad, straight down. S to I, P to A glide, in that notch now. Take my tissue slack, scoop in behind the clavicle, right there. Reinforce my thumb if I need to. Drop my hands, drop my body down. And I'm gonna push straight, P to A, and range and feel there. A to P glide, it's the only one where I come around to the front. Medial hand, still thumb. Uh, turn the feet this way, please. Still now on that joint line, but I'm on the anterior lateral aspect of the clavicle. Drop my forearm down, fingers around the back here, take it into end range and feel there for A to P. That's the C and AC, right? A supine for me, there in your back. GH joint. Is it okay if I place your arm in between my knees? Remember, lower the patient's arm down, step then between, don't just shove the arm up in between the doctor's legs here. From the same position, 
with my contact, I can take my hand on the outside, thumb in the axle, to stabilize the patient's shoulder, distract the long axis, and range and feel there. Come around to the front, bring my body over the contact, distract with the legs, push down A to B. Get rid of the thumbs, interlace behind the aspect of the humerus here, posterior aspect, distract, pull up PA. And the L, step out, back in the axilla, hand goes around the patient's abdomen, forearm across the chest, stabilize, distract out and the L, and range and feel there. Internal and external. Uh, my back's going to block most of this, so let me see if we can go overhead. <laughs> Stabilize the patient's humerus, okay? Let the arm, we're going to go into external, let it drape over the arm. Superior hand goes on top, inferior hand goes on bottom, as close to that joint line as I can get. I lean back to distract that joint, and now everything here turns into external rotation. Okay, and range and feel. Internal rotation. Switch the arm, switch the hands. Inferior hand on top, elbows winged out, distract, everything goes into internal rotation. Okay? S to I glide. Okay. Inflection. Here. Here. Have that humerus locked against your shoulder. Keep the elbow pointing straight up. I'm going to distract a little bit away from the body here, then pull straight down S to I and range and feel. A to P, M to L glide, cross the chest, switch my body, still blocking the elbow, distract out, and remember, M to L to A to P, we're going posterior and lateral, so it comes down and out, and range and feel there. Last one, that's the eye and abduction, here, contact right on top of the uh, the humerus come off the acromion, distract with both hands here, forearm down, parallel to the floor, S to I, and range and feel. Okay? <laughs> okay, so, what is that, 6, 4, 10, 19 procedures, okay, for that assessment. So, get your flow down, and you can transition back and forth pretty quickly. All right, questions on any of those? <laughs> Good? Okay, next round. <laughs> okay. Oh, the squirrel. All right, so we're going to start with our anterior posterior glide. Ooh. Primary contact is going to be our yeah. hypothenar eminence onto the anterior medial aspect of the clavicle. Hopefully your partner brought something that you can manipulate so you can see the FC joints today. The other part of this kind of going to roll this here so you can get contact. Right. The other part of this is I'm going to use the arm to create a little bit of a distraction force. So as I take the hand on, we're going to do the left SC in this case, it's okay to kind of create this arm. I'm going to have the forearm kind of rest in between my flank and my arm here, and then a distraction force onto the distal humerus. It'll make sense once we go a little bit further, but if I can, I want to cradle this part of the arm. If I leave this part of the arm free, as soon as I go to pull, sometimes it'll kind of fall and hit themselves. So I get a little bit more control of the arm if I kind of brace in between my flank. Depending on your patient's arm length, you can kind of poke it. I'm going to come to this side just to show it. You can kind of poke the arm, the arm fall out of the back if you need to. Their arm's longer than your arm. In this case, we're going to be all right. From here, I'm going to move the arms out of the way, right over that anterior medial aspect of the clavicle with a soft, eyes contact. 
are going to take this traction force, <laughs> pulling proximal to distal. I'm going to come over the top of my contact. And then from this point, it's just a push extension of the elbow. The arm, you want to get as close to 90 as you can. So in this case, i got to bring him up just a little bit more there. Get to that 90 degree force. And range, small push to achieve that adjustment there. A lot of these adjustments in the SC are uncomfortable. So please, I mentioned it on Tuesday, but please palpate to actually make sure they have a restriction before you just go in and finish that adjustment. Doesn't mean you can't sit up, doesn't mean you can't take a bend range, but just be careful with your amplitude depth. All right, for the AFB, for the AFB, we can also leave them in kind of an arm rested position. That's okay too. I think everyone's gonna prefer the arm kind of cradle to get more of a lockout. If I come over the top here with that kind of soft pilot form and reinforce, it's pretty hard to get to end range. It feels like it's gonna go all day versus cradling the arm, creating that distraction force. Then that's locked out pretty early there. So again, a couple variations for that. I think all of us in here are gonna prefer the arm up. Next, procedure six. in the supine position, we'll get to see it later today. There is, just like we had before, arm is up. There's also an arm in horizontal extension. Some people will call it horizontal abduction. So my support hand, same position here. Digit contact behind the clavicle. So that's gonna be a little bit uncomfortable. I want to get as close to the joint as possible. For the P to A glide, it's sometimes it's hard to get in right behind that joint where you want to. Start a little bit more distal. Grab your contact. I'm okay there. And I'm just going to kind of work my way more medial until I get to the point where his neck musculature is going to force me out to where I can't get a good contact. Again, it should be as close to the joint as possible. Get it right there, so I apologize. From here, I can take that same distractive force over the top of my contact, and now it's a digit pull straight up posterior to anterior. The secondary position, arm and extension, it's nice because you get a little bit more lockout from the support arm, but sometimes it puts you in a little bit of a weird position to complete your adjustment. So, same thing, digit contact behind the clavicle. Now the arm is going to kind of drop into that extended position, right about there, past either, I guess you call it 90 or zero. This point here, and now I'm pulling up. But you can see as I drop that arm into extension, now I'm sacrificing my doctor position a little bit, so you guys can kind of play with what's more comfortable for you. Normally I'd stay a little bit taller just because it's easier for me to pull, but you will get a better end kind of feel if you bring them into that extended position. So just to clarify, I'm calling this 90 degrees of flexion. I'm going to call this kind of a relative extended position, or you could call it abducted, or it's still 90 degrees of flexion, it's just in kind of a different point. So again, it's going to be, a, I just want to kind of clarify that. So this is where we were before, 90 degrees of flexion. This would be our extended position, relatively past this kind of neutral abducted position. Does that make sense? It's a little bit confusing to show up to so many degrees of freedom. Sometimes when you speak, it doesn't actually line up with what you're saying. <laughs> so I want to clarify that. So practice those two to start. <laughs> These are our S to I and I to S slides of the SC joint. Do you have any shoulder issues? Well, you have, to check, you have to check with jujitsu people because they pop their things out. They're like, oh, it's not that bad. I pop back in. Uh, <laughs> take your arm out of the sleep for me. Okay, okay, there. All right. So we're going to start with the I to S slide. Two variations for this one. There's a covered thumb contact and there's a hypothenar contact. The one you're going to see in your manual is the covered thumb contact. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, there's also, I do like a covered thumb with a hypothenar, but there's also a thumb over thumb. And I'll show you why I do the covered 
typo being R in just a second. So for our I to S Y, it's going to come right underneath the cloud pool here. So we have that. Just adhere to that medial aspect of the clavicle. You'll see in your manual, they have this kind of covered thumb that kind of looks like a choke sign. You can switch your thumb, so you're more in this position here. So you're going to miss the patient, but again, if I slip, I might strike my patient. I like to use a covered thumb with a hypothene arm. So if I drop anywhere, go ahead and take your uh, right arm and just distract your tissue. There you go, keep that in. You're going to hold this here, right over the top. Good. That way, if I miss here, everything's going away from the patient. Does that make sense? So again, you'll see in your manual, they have kind of the covered thumb that looks kind of like you're going to choke someone. They have what Dr. Schmeier said, <laughs> that kind of this up. But I'll switch to a hypothenar covered thumb, just again, so I'm away from everything with my patient. I'm going to have to drop low, as I to S as I can get, and range, and a small push to achieve that adjustment there. There's a variation with just a hypothenar contact. I'm going to take this arm here. My arm kind of falls. Good. I built the arm just underneath that clavicle, same kind of position. I can distract the arm towards me. Same thing, drop my body as low as I can go, as I to S as I can get, and then push from that position. One thing I didn't mention before with the humorous distraction, because you're away from the FC joint, it works anytime you kind of pull the humerus away, you're going to generally move the SC joint, kind of distract the SC joint. So the position of the humerus doesn't necessarily matter because it's distal from your joint contact. Does that make sense? There are some questions on that that I just wanted to clarify. All right, next we have our S to I glide. And we have the one from the manual we'll show you first. The one thing to note is that this is full abduction. It looks like flexion in the manual because it all kind of looks the same. This one, I'm going to take your arm just kind of cradle here. So I'm just cradling the arm and the elbow. You're going to take contact, same thing with your right hand. Just go ahead and cover yourself there. Good. High both in our contact. Now I'm going to come into full abduction. And I can push from this position here. The abducted arm gives you a very good and end range and end feel before you complete that adjustment. There is a variation where you leave the arm in a neutral position. And now I'm going to do that kind of covered thumb contact. Again, disadvantages to this one is I have to manipulate the head if I'm trying to do a covered thumb. One thumb there, one thumb here. Again, I have to drop myself low. And with the thumb, you can kind of see it don't have good congruency onto that contact. The hypothenar in this case for me works a lot better because again, you don't feel like the pain on your patient's tissue. It feels like you're going to kind of roll off of that platform. So again, I recommend the arm distracted move just because you get a little bit more purchase onto that joint. Questions about the I to S, S to I glides? We're going to start with M to L and L to M glide of the SC joint. Maybe let's go overhead. Thank you. For our SC joints, we have medial and lateral glides. If I'm going to be treating this patient for lateral to medial glide, do you want to stand on the ipsilateral side or the contralateral side? Yeah. Lateral to medial. Ipsy side, good. So on the lateral to medial, for the supine position, we're going to push. So we're going to be on the ipsilateral side. For M to L glide, which side will we be on? Contralateral side, right? When we get to the seat position, you can push and pull. You'll dictate that, so it doesn't really matter which side you necessarily stand on. But your body position will change. We'll get to that on Thursday, hopefully. So SC joint. I'll expose it. Okay, if I pull this out, you can get relaxed. Arms are going to be relaxed. As we can see, there's that medial border of the clavicle, which will articulate with the SC joint. As often or as best we can, we want to be as close to that joint line as possible. 
If I'm doing a lateral to medial glide, it might take a couple times to set this up because there is some good skin pull on certain patients. If I start really close to that joint, I'm just going to use my finger just so you can see, and I take that tissue pull, I'm actually past the SC joint, I'm in that kind of maneuvering space. So again, it might take you a few tries to make sure you end up on that medial aspect of the clavicle going towards the SC joint. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could theoretically, Tim's asking if you could theoretically tissue slack here and then replace that, sure. I think once you guys get used to it, it'll, it'll kind of come up intuitively for you, but yeah, you, you theoretically could absolutely do that. For these procedures, we're gonna use our superior hand. Why superior versus inferior hand for these? If I miss with my inferior hand, my thumb is gonna go right into my patient's throat and or face. So again, superior hand's a little bit better for these. If you have a patient, you can have with their opposite hand, go ahead and cover your chest tissue there and pull down if you're worried about making any incidental contact. I think you're okay there, you can move that just for the camera view better. This procedure, we're gonna use a hypothenar contact. More so, it's always important, but it's more so articulated here. If I'm able to approximate my hand and soften that hypothenar tissue, when I take my tissue slack, it makes that a pretty comfortable contact. It's, I can be here kind of all day in that position. I don't want to be because it's sensitive tissue, but if I go with a rigid, firm hand, especially if my fingers are extended, what will happen is it will be a, a firmer tissue pull, and they're going to perceive that a little bit more because there's not that kind of tissue barrier softening that articulation. So without further ado, I'm going to come in, again, hypothenar contact onto the SC joint. Again, depending on your patient, you can go with more of a flat hand or you can kind of curve your hand a little bit to get to avoid any sensitive anatomy. Reinforce tissue slack, L to M. Drop my body low so I'm in line with that tissue. End range. From this point, I can push across to achieve that adjustment. Oftentimes, just like we talked about lower extremity, speed is the most important factor. With the SC joint specifically, your line of drive is going to play a big factor, so you're not pushing the clavicle posteriorly when you don't need to be. So if I don't drop myself low and I come up here, now I'm doing more of an A to P L to M versus a pure L to M line of drive. For our M to L, again, we're going to be on the contralateral side. So what, am I treating the left or the right a, or SC joint? Left. left, good. Same thing, you're going to try to find the medial aspect of that clavicle. Did you enter this one at all? From this position, I'm going to, as best I can, get as close to that joint line. Again, it might take you a few tries getting comfortable with these, finding where you can take that contact and still stay as medial as you can on that clavicle to affect the joint as best you can. Same thing, I'm going to kind of approximate my hand for a soft contact, reinforce, the body drops low, end range. From here, I could push to achieve that end field. Again, practice these, get in the right positions, and make sure to start working on softening those contacts so it's not as painful for your patient. Questions on those two? All right, go with those two, and then we will come back in about. So we're going to start with our A and B and Cynthia to the table facing out. Yeah. All right. So we're <laughs> So we're going to start with our A and B and Cynthia to the table facing out. Yeah. Alright, so we're going to start with A to P glide in the seated position. Actually, it's 39 degrees now, but this we can show this first. I won't adjust in this position, but just to kind of emphasize that setup, my body really needs to be, as I'm taking time to <laughs> feel my kind of flight against here. My body really needs to line up on the other side of the sternum here. A common fault is being too high in this position, and then when I push, you can see they're not locked in that position. If I get right behind that joint and I push, see how it takes out some of that gas plate and you'll go ahead and face that way. So again, I'll show you the setup and kind of walk you through, but I just want to emphasize that your body position for these matters a ton. If you're not directly kind of behind that joint, they're going to feel you're going to feel like they never get to end range because they're not, because they're going to kind of turn their thoracic spine and create more end range, not in this quick 
Eight feet glide, there's two positions and two variations. Do you have any shoulder issues in the past? So we're going to go anterior posterior glide. I'm going to use a DNR contact. I like DNR in these positions because it's very soft. You could theoretically use hypo DNR. The issue with hypo DNR is I come across, sorry, I'm going to choke you here again. If I come across hypo DNR, that looks like a choke that I'm setting up on my patient. <laughs> Tim's nice, so we won't have to choke Tim. <laughs> Lucky open zone, you have to skate. Sorry, DNR contact over the top here. If I can, I'm going to try to use my hand to create some of that distractive force. You can use either hand in this position. I believe Dr. Semeno prefers hips lateral hand, but for us it doesn't matter a ton. Uh, it'll make a little bit more sense when we get further on why we like hips lateral hand. So I'm going to be behind my patient again, kind of fencer facing the feet, or the foot of the table. I'm going to take my forearm and take a distractive force here, and then reinforce to create that line of drive A to B. So you can see when I push through, he's locked out, I'm pulling into myself from this position here. We could switch hands in this position. It doesn't matter, it's not, it's kind of whatever you're comfortable with. The nice thing about having an ips lateral hand is your primary contact, so I'm able to get a lot of good distraction with my support hand before I come and reinforce. And range, small push, or pull, excuse me, to achieve that adjustment. We can, if you remember from your palpation series, bring the arm up into 90 degrees of abduction and 90 degrees of flexion. So just to emphasize up here in front, I'm going to support the arm, take my contact, and now with my support hand, create that distractive force. Oh, the watch, huh? Alright. Arm resting on my arm, like drop. Contact hand first. Support hand creates that distractive force. Pull in and range. Small pull to achieve the adjustment there. Again, anytime you're using the arm, you tend to get a little bit more end range and end feel with that adjustment, but you can leave the arm to the side for this procedure. That's totally fine. Yeah, you, you might need to go get your partner. I'll have some fun with you. If we come to posterior to anterior glide, we have our um, arm has to be up in this position for us to get behind. So our starting position is going to look like our anterior posterior. This will give you some room to kind of come in behind that clavicle if I can. Maybe like this. From this position, I'm going to take that distractive force again, but now the arm comes back into that kind of horizontal extended position. So again, get my contact, bring it back, head range, and you can push from that position for end field. Again, not common, or not very common that you need the P to A glide. But again, big notes, I need to match my body on the other side of that contact. And as much as I can, I want to bring that arm into an extended position to achieve that end range and end field. Questions about those two? Good. <laughs> What's our rule for I to S and S to I glide? What's the arm position? Oh, I'm not looking. Yes, I. <laughs> Sorry. Let I look at it right. later. I to I, I to S, let it rest. <laughs> My fault, let's do it. All right. <laughs> so, for our <laughs> seated position, that's going to hold true. We still need to brace the back just like we were before. Try it. We had a little, we had a little breakout session over here, but try it if you don't support the back and feel end range, then when you get in there and actually support on the other side of the, the joint and see those kind of differences in end range, it does make a big difference. So I to S fly with you first, I to S, let it rest. Same thing gonna come on here, kind of support your back. We're gonna take a contact right in front of it. 
So the same thing, I'm going to brace myself on the back. Move that to the side just a little bit. DR contact underneath and kind of taking almost like a little bit of a scooping motion there to get to that end range position. Um, underneath the clavicle, and all it is is a small pull up to achieve that adjustment. Pretty straightforward. We can absolutely normally get a pretty good purchase with that, but we can take that forearm to the other side and we can take it to the same side as well to just increase that congruency and increase that tension at that joint. So a little bit of a difference between there between locking the shoulder down and out. So again, use your body. These are point ones that you kind of get, but Tim coined three point contact. Contact in front, sorry, contact in back, contact in front, and then contact on the shoulders here. So you do get a lot of distracted force for these yeah, techniques, which is why I prefer the seat position versus two five unless I have a tool in work. Nope. Then those are really fun and really high success rate for those adjustments. Okay. I don't, I don't. As to eye glide, we have our arm in the elevated you. position. Oh, okay. Thank you. To so about what degree are we going to for our S to eye glide? In the seated position. Six. <laughs> kind of, yeah, 100 to 110. So arm's going to come underneath here. Yes, okay, drop. Take my contact. Again, I prefer a DR contact. You can't go thumb over thumb contact here. That's okay. I prefer DR because I get a pretty good pull on top of that. Lift the arm up, distract the other side, down as the eye, and from here it's a push down. You can, if you need to, if you like your other hand, come in here, this lateral side first, contralateral hand is supporting. So you can do kind of either one, play with those, see which contact you prefer. Dr. Wright mentioned earlier, and I think all the docs in this room probably have the same thing. We'll bounce between its lateral and contralateral based on the patient's anatomy and what kind of feels best. Sometimes it's a lateral handle feel really good, sometimes contralateral handle feel really good. So play with those two different contacts and see which one you like more. Questions about I to S and S to I glide? Straightforward. Again, these look like your palpation series, so hopefully just a couple little tweaks and you guys are on the right path. So practice those two, and then we have two more for you before you. But I think actually I'm going to prefer a pull in this position. Just tell your proctor, hey, I know I switched from a push to a pull, but I get a better, I get a better contact with this hand. That's totally fine. That's one where we'll kind of let it fly. What we don't want to see is, let's say we're setting up for an L to N glide. I'm going to take a contact just kind of right, right here. You're going to do a little bit of pressure on your back. Okay. If I set up for an L to N glide, and I'm in a full position here, let's say I walked in, and I said I, I'm going to do an L to N glide, I'm going to do a pull. And you come in and you do this. So this is now a push procedure without stating that push procedure. So again, if you set it up, and let's say you wrote a push, and you come and set it up, and you go, mm, I don't like that. Dr. Wright, I'm actually going to switch to a pull procedure and switch my hands. Dr. Wright's going to say, good, go for it. And now I'm going to switch to this position for more of a pull. So again, we're, we're allowing you to kind of switch on the fly. Again, you have to let us know, though, because we're going to assume whatever you do, whatever you wrote, whatever you do, need to match. And if you, if you flip it on the fly, that's totally fine with us. All right, so L to M and N to L glide. So just like I set up there before, same thing, contact on your back, and you get a little contact on your front here, okay? So if I do an L to M glide, I'm going to do a pull procedure first. I normally, for whatever reason, prefer the pulls. Dr. Smith prefers the pushes. Sometimes I'll switch between the two, but again, you guys can kind of play with these and set these up. So if you're doing a pull procedure, I like to kind of face towards the joint that I'm going to pull. In this case, we're going to do a left SC joint. I'm going to come right in front. You can either take a high or a contact. A lot of times, I'll use a calcaneal contact. I'll try to pinch the clavicle just to create a little bit more comfort for the patient so they don't feel like they're kind of jamming onto their joint. Again, either one's fine. I kind of pinch that clavicle here, reinforce, and I'm still going to try to get those GH joints kind of distracted away as I pull it L to M here. End range, little pull if you need to do end field. If I do a push, a lot of times I will now switch which way I'm facing to go in line with kind of the way I am pushing. So push procedure here, reinforce, bring the GH just a little bit, distract good there, and then push from that position. Again, the hands will kind of mirror each other, so one hand's pushing, one hand's pulling, so your primary contact is the one you're dictating push 
and or her push or pull. X alkali, it's going to look the exact same. So if I'm going to do an M to L, we'll start with a pull. I'm still in that kind of position where I'm facing this way, and now my contact's coming in front. Distract and pull. They're going to a push. This position. Distract and push. For me, I prefer pull with the M to L and then push with the L to M. Whatever reason, I don't know if it's me pull. or... Uh, patient or whatever it is, but I feel like I'm going to want to join out again. Yeah. Switching between push and pull in that position. Questions on those two? Normally those are pretty easy to digest. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Yeah, so again, I'm going to try to block the back, and as much as I can, when I take my contacts, I'm going to try to distract and bring in the arms back. And your patient will kind of dictate how much of that distracting force you'll need. Any other questions? Good? All right, those two, and then you're free to go. Thank you. Okay. A lot of people forget about that little key component, so I want to harp on it a lot today. So for our first adjustment, anterior posterior glide, my lateral hand is going to be stabilizing the humerus, and my medial hand is going to be my primary contact on the anterior I guess lateral or distal component of the clavicle. I'm gonna reinforce with my support hand. So if I have my contact hand, it's gonna, it'll invert when we do it later, but just to show my camera. My primary contact hand with my medial hand, stabilizing the, the humerus and reinforcing that contact, thumb over thumb contact. So for this position here, I'm just gonna kind of hold your humerus and take a contact and bring your clavicle. You okay with that? I might have to sacrifice my medial hand a little bit so I don't block the entire thing. Um, so just bear with me for one second. Let's see how this plays out on camera. So I'm coming on the anterior aspect of the clavicle. Yeah, I'll get that out of the way. Perfect. Normally, again, my elbow is straight over this contact here, so I'm going to push anterior to posterior, but I was winging it out just so that you guys can see on camera. My lateral hand, stabilizing the humerus as much as I can, reinforcing that contact. Anterior to posterior, and range. If I need to do an adjustment here, this actually feels like it's moving okay. It's a small little push into that, and range to achieve the adjustment. Let's go lateral view real quick, just so we can see the body set up for the dog. Perfect. So again, medial hand, lateral hand stabilizing. As I get to end range, I'm going to come over the top of my patient so I'm as anterior to posterior as I can be. And then from here, small tricep extension to complete that adjustment. Just like everything we've talked about in extremities so far, speed is key. You don't need a ton of force to move these already pretty movable joints. Work on shallow amplitude and high speed adjustments within control. So we don't want you to just push as fast as you can without control still kind of control that area. So one more time, let's go overhead again just to show that contact. Thank you. Thumb with my medial hand. Kind of have this inverted hand so it's out of the way from the patient and away from any pertinent anatomy. Stabilizing the humerus. Reinforce. Lean over the contact. Anterior to posterior. Small push if I need to complete that adjustment. Our next contact is going to be a posterior anterior glide. This is going to be a digit contact similar to your palpation series. Oh, yeah, we'll show the, maybe I'll do it, oh, I'll do it right now, or I'll forget. We also have a variation for our anterior to posterior glide. For this one, you're going to stand on the contralateral side, and we're going to hold the humerus to about 60 degrees of flexion. Come over to this side here. Let's have your left hand just kind of cover yourself there. Just, just in front, perfect. Let your arm drop. Okay. So I'm going to cradle the humerus, letting the forearm kind of rest on my forearm. That way I can control how much flexion I need in this joint. I'm going to take a hypothenar contact onto that same anterior distal aspect of the clavicle. Hypothenar contact here, let your arm drop on the right side. Let this drop, good. Okay. Pull to about 60 degrees. Lean over my patient, get my head out of the way as much as I can. Lean over the patient, anterior, posterior, end range, small push, 
to achieve that adjustment there. Mm. You know what I love, never lines. If we look at our anterior posterior glide in the supine position with that variation, not in your manual, definitely write it down. What adjustment does that look similar to in the SC joint? Close, yeah, kind of. An A to P of the AC joint. Normally we stand on the hips lateral side, but we still have that form, that form, or the humerus flex component to the tune of 90 degrees. So again, if we're asking you something on an assessment, that's a pretty good one for us to ask you, that kind of 90 degrees versus 60 degrees assessment. So don't get those confused in your head there. For our posterior anterior glide, you can move that now, you're okay there, unless you feel comfortable there. For the posterior anterior glide, I'm gonna start medial on the clavicle with my digit contact and work as close as I can to that joint space as long as Bless I can you. still get a good handle on the clavicle. Depending on your patient's anatomy, you might have to be a little bit more proximal, but you ideally want to be as distal as you can over that joint space. Does that make sense? Normally, I'll start a little bit more medial, mm -hmm. kind of right where the strap is here, get my contact and kind of work my way distally until basically I run out of room and the shoulder won't let me get any closer to that distal clavicle towards the AC joint. What we don't want to see is pulling directly from kind of this midline point, not even trying to get out to the lateral aspect. You're less likely to have a successful adjustment there. Very uncomfortable for the patient to pull on the medial clavicle because again, not that you're gonna fracture the clavicle necessarily by pulling on it, but that is a weak point in the clavicle if we're looking at percentages for fractures. Again, normally you're not gonna have a successful adjustment because you're so far away from the distal aspect of the clavicle anyways. So again, contact hand, digits of the second and third fingers, stabilizing the humerus. Again, very important for this one because again, if I pull this clavicle and I watch the shoulder, that's still gonna move that whole entire shoulder hurdle. So I wanna stabilize the humerus so when I pull posterior to anterior, I'm not pulling the entire shoulder hurdle. I'm trying to isolate my force onto the clavicle. This one's a little bit uncomfortable. I'm gonna take a contact kind of right behind your clavicle there, okay? So again, stabilize here. I'll try to get my arm as much out of the way as I can. Again, I want my forearm perpendicular. I'm gonna to have to sacrifice that position a little bit just so that you can see the contact a little bit better. So again, I'm gonna start medial, work my way lateral. That's probably about as close as I can get to the end of that joint there. Stabilizing the humerus here. I would roll my hand back in this position to pull straight up, but again, just to kind of show you, stabilize and range. And then from that point on, pull. Let's go lateral view just to show the doctor position. Perfect. So stabilizing the humerus. Going to work my way from medial to lateral, just to the end, directly over my contact. Stabilize and pull posterior to anterior. Again, once we get to the end range component, it's not moving. We can just give it a little bit of a bicep contraction pull. Again, not super common that you'll see that, but more common than the SC joint. They, they do pop up more, so SC joints are very rare. Questions about A to P and P to A? You guys think you can handle two more while we're here? All right. We have our inferior to superior glide. Uh, let's go overhead one more time. I shouldn't say one more time, it's gonna happen a few more times. Instead of being on the anterior aspect of the clavicle, I wanna be just inferior so I can push the clavicle from inferior to superior. Just like our SC joint, I'll, I prefer to invert my thumb just so that I can keep my hands kind of away from the patient's face. You do have some more room out here where you're not necessarily going to strike your patient if you slip off but I just kind of take as much of the guesswork out of it as I can and normally I'll invert my thumb so that I'm not on the patient's, uh, not gonna accidentally strike the patient. If you're having trouble when you're going from inferior to superior where the whole shoulder girdle's moving, I can have my patient kind of sit on their own uh, hand to kind of stabilize that joint a little bit or if they're okay with it bring your hand out, I'm just gonna kind of have your arm between my legs and the just like our long axis distraction, I can bring the patient's arm between my legs to stop the joint as I'm going from inferior to superior from bringing the whole shoulder girdle up. 
Again, that's kind of up to you guys how you pick to do that. Just for the camera, we don't need to do that here. We're going to show you the contacts first. So again, same thing, my medial hand is going to be on the inferior aspect of the clavicle. I'm going to get my middle and my main contact hand away just for a second. So if I take that kind of little scoop tissue slack on the underside of the clavicle, and if I drop my body really low, again, this hand, ignore it for now, it would be there. If I drop my body really low, then I can glide from inferior to superior. I can also stabilize with my lateral hand kind of around the acromion and part of the glenohumeral or the uh, humeral head. So as I'm pushing from inferior to superior, I'm trying to isolate that motion about the clavicle and not the entire shoulder girdle. So let's go lateral view just to show the doctor position. Thank you. So we get low here again, stabilizing. Medial hand contact as far lateral as I can get. Drop my body low, inferior to superior, pushing I to S to complete that adjustment. Again, small tricep contraction, focusing on the speed. We'll stay in this view for just a second. So if I'm going now superior to inferior, I'm going to stand facing my patient's feet. Same thing, I'm going to try to stabilize as much as I can the humerus, but I don't have to worry too much about that as I take my contact onto the now superior aspect of the clavicle. Same thing, cover thumb contact. Going to drop my body low. End range and small push to achieve the adjustment there. Looks just like your palpation for the most part. Questions about those four? Good, all right, practice those four. So we're going to start with our long axis distraction procedure of the GH joint. Can I have a volunteer who's not mind having their glenohumeral joint on camera? All right, I'm come on up. Do you have any shoulder I'm not doing that for issues? the midterm, for the final yes. Sure. Yeah. 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 Those oh, that's fine. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. So we're going to start with our long axis distraction procedure. Oh, well, it's just a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right. This is going to look just like your palpation procedure. My medial hand is going to take an inverted web. So if this is a web contact, invert the web so I can get as close to the joint as possible. Don't be afraid of getting into someone's armpit. To get your proper contact, you're going to have to get in there. Lots of hand sanitizer. Um, for working in the shoulder joint. Again, most of the time you don't even notice it after a little bit. My lateral hand is going to grab onto the humerus and kind of initiate that motion. But a lot of my distractive force is going to be from my legs going into an extended position. Just like anything we've done with long axis where the patient's appendage is between our legs, we want to control the force we use by once we get to that extended point, that's as much amplitude as we can have. What we don't want to see is what we talked about earlier, we're going to spend knee position, then kind of hop back. Very unsafe for the patient, again, especially in the shoulder, which by definition is the most dislocated joint in the body. You need to be very careful with how you modulate your force in this specific region. So for this procedure, you're going to have to have your arm kind of between my legs here. You okay with that? I'm going to take contact kind of right in your armpit. Let me know if you're uncomfortable at all. I'm still going to do it, but you can just let me know. Alright. <laughs> so I have arm between the leg here. Again, inverted web contact. As much as I can. I don't think it's going to work today. Inverted web contact. My stabilization hand here is just staying in this position. As I take the distractive force, I'm going to try to lock this in to isolate the humerus away from the glenoid fossa. Lateral hand on the humerus here. Again, stabilizing, pushing, maybe overhead, that might be worse. <laughs> oh, maybe it's better. Stabilizing here, grabbing the humerus, distracting away, 
And already we're kind of at end range in this position. Let's go lateral view just to show the box, the doctor position. Beautiful. Okay, my knees are just barely bent. Mm -hmm. I'm extending out, and that's kind of end range for him to achieve the adjustment. Just a small little kick back with the legs. You are using your lateral hand to pull and distract in this position here. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brown. That's just a reminder how easily you can you can get stuff done. <laughs> All right. So again, stabilizing here, locking this part in the web contact as close to the joints as you can get with this lateral hand, distracting from proximal to distal and extending the legs back. And range is about here. Small little kick back to achieve the adjustment there. Again, arms coming with my legs, this arm stabilizing that joint in. Questions about the restriction within the long axis? Question. Do you have any tricks to avoid? Because some patients sometimes get some problems when you have their uh, like, uh, arm moving your legs and then you're distracted. Sometimes it hurts them in a way. And mm -hmm. then you're also having yeah. pressure. Do you have any tricks around this? Yeah, you could, you could pat it with like a towel. So you can wrap their arm in a towel and then squeeze the arm if they feel uncomfortable with that. That's totally fine. Yep. Yeah, I don't think, we don't show any of the other stuff really. There's other ways to do this adjustment procedure too where you don't have to have their arm between the legs, but we don't show that. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. Again, long at, or restrictions within the long axis for the GH joint specifically, I don't prefer to do very often because it's an already unstable joint. We're taking a general <laughs> restriction to a generally unstable joint. Does that make sense? As much as I can for the GH joint, I want to isolate force to decrease the risk for the patient. More common sense than mobilization. Yeah, Dr. Smith said more common sense than mobilization. What is it? So normally you won't see like an HBLA, you'll see them get in this position here. <laughs> and oftentimes I, I kind of leave the shoulder here and you kind of pull within that long axis. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, so Dr. Smith was saying post-surgical, grade one and grade two, just to kind of move fluid in and out of that joint, just try to get things moving a little bit. For our next procedure, we're gonna do an anterior posterior glide in a supine position, which <laughs> means we will have a seated procedure probably on Thursday if we get to it and we have time. So we might have, to, might have to save it for next week, depending on how much time we have. But again, this is gonna look just like your palp palpation procedure. Same thing for this procedure. I'm just going to come between my legs here. I'm going to take a contact kind of right on front. Let's go uh, overhead real quick. Beautiful. Just like our iliac moral joint, we're going to start with the arm abducted. I'm going to take uh, contact around the arm, and my thumbs are going to come right over the top of the joint. One reason you start with the arm abducted is to get into the axilla as best you can. But then as I bring the body back to its midline position, I'm going to create a little bit of a distraction force here as well. From this position, I can use my legs just to take a little bit of tension into the joint from proximal to distal. I'm going to lean my body over. Let's go side view. Lean my body over that contact, and I'm pushing straight anterior to posterior. Again, this is in the supine position. We will show you a seated variation next week. So again, end range, little distraction, HP, small push to achieve the adjustment there. Also a great position for mobilizations early in shoulder rehab. You have a really good amount of body weight and force over that contact where you can really kind of move that shoulder joint pretty easily without a lot of force for yourself. Safer for the patient. Again, we will show the seated variation that you guys have seen all over the Tic Tac and Instagram. <laughs> Thursday or Tuesday. <laughs> That's how I feel about Tic Tac. <laughs> All right, questions about those two. Okay, practice those on camera. We're going to start with M to L and our M to L AV adjustments. They are 52, or sorry, 82, 82 and 83 in the manual. All right. Do you have any shoulder issues? 
I have to see if we can cause one. <laughs> uh, let's go face up. <laughs> Thank you. Questions on the MTL mm -hmm. line? Get feedback today. All right. Next one, A to PMDL. This is one of my favorite adjustments for GH joint. We talked about the posterior capsule on Tuesday, and we showed you the A to P line. I'm going to move you up a little bit so I can get feedback. Oh, it's upside down, though. So we talked about posterior capsule on Tuesday. A to P M to L glide, or a posterior lateral glide, is going to affect the posterior lateral aspect of the capsule. So again, once you're palpating all these, you're going to find commonly the posterior capsule tends to be tight, which means we're going to use more kind of those A to P moves. The other one we'll see all the time in just a second is the S to I glide, in either flexion or abduction, but we're going to start with AP and L. You'll see different doctors set this up differently. We'll talk about advantages and disadvantages to both now. If I'm doing my A to P and L and the arms up, I can either have my head on the side towards the patient's head, or I can have my head on the side towards the patient's uh, torso. Advantages and disadvantages to both, you're going to be right next to their head. Obviously, if you're on the head side, you're going to be right next to sensitive tissue if you're on the chest side. Depending on your preference as a doctor, you can kind of work around that. Oftentimes, if I work towards the chest side, I'll put about a, a barrier of a towel, have the patient cover themselves, things like that. I prefer to be on the head side because I can watch the patient's face for any apprehension signs that I set up. Again, the shoulder tends to be a little bit unstable, so I want to see as I'm moving the shoulder, if the patient's wincing, grimacing, looks like they're uncomfortable at all. But you will see doctors who. Just 
like a little femoral joint. You can, and you will see docs do this. It's just a little bit less specific as you cross your hands, as opposed to taking a nice firm knife edge contact and then reinforcing that contact. Doesn't matter which arm you use, but we're gonna pull equally with both arms, both anterior to posterior and needle to lateral. This one sometimes can get a little bit um, misconstrued. You can almost think of it like a distal to proximal. We're pushing down into the bone as we're pulling out end to L. So it's not from here in a straight end to L pull. We're actually taking the arm down and then both moving it back. It's gonna look more like end to L, but you can almost picture this kind of scooping motion to complete that adjustment. <laughs> I was going to tell yeah, you that. Yeah, because you is anterior posterior kind of down along the long axis of the humerus. So I'm going to use my shoulder to stabilize. Again, you'll kind of have to figure out what's better for your patient. I often find if I lean over a little bit more, I get some softer tissue. Some people prefer to stay higher because they're more away from the patient. That's totally fine, whatever you're comfortable with. I'm going to take my contact in. So I'm going to abduct the arm first to get my contact. Reinforce. I'm going to bring the arm up into that 90 degrees of flexion position. I'm going to take my tissue slack, kind of distal to proximal, or sorry, yeah, distal to proximal, pull it out. You can feel a little bit of tightness there. So as I'm pulling here, I can actually feel that shoulder kind of stopping. And if I pay attention, the place I'm feeling the tightness, you come over on this side, I can actually feel that tightness kind of moving in here. Do you have any shoulder, you don't have any shoulder pain or anything like that? You okay if I give this just a little bit of a push? Pull. Okay, so I'm gonna get in that contact, back up to that neutral position. Good, right there, perfect, good. Hmm. You blinked, you missed it. <laughs> Any questions before you guys practice? All right, practice those two and we'll come back for our S to I glides. All right, can I have a patient up here who's not mind having their GH on camera? So we're gonna go S to I in flexion and S to I in abduction. Again, they're gonna look just like your palpations here. Like we'll go left shoulder. So we're gonna go over here. Just gonna, no, you're good. You can lay down. Face up. <laughs> sorry, sorry, the camera person. We're gonna go. <laughs> just gonna have to go on the left shoulder because that one's already right shoulder moving. All right, perfect. Uh, I'm gonna start with flexion just because it's a little bit easier. So for our A to P M to L, we're facing facing our patient. For our SI inflection, we're gonna face the head. You have to use your medial shoulder in this case, you don't get a preference there. <coughs> and if you do feel uncomfortable, if you don't like going head up with your patient in this position, you can kind of look, look away to the side if you don't wanna make the contact. One thing we will see here that happens more so with the A to P seated, which we'll see in a second, but we don't want the patient to grab their own trap or cervical spine in this position. So sometimes you'll see people set up, go ahead and just grab it. Bad, bad doctor, grab your neck. You, you can't even get there. Okay. So you'll see this sometimes. Again, it creates tension in the joint. One, two, as I pull, I'm on their face, and if they rebound at all, it's gonna hit them in the face. So again, relax your arm there. Just have the arm kind of fall to the side in that position there. So for our SI glide, we're gonna use our shoulder and chest again to kind of block the distal humerus. And from here, we're just pulling straight <coughs> S to I in a flexed position. Arms up. I normally come a little bit to the side just to get my contact. I go opposite knee from the patient up. Get my contact position here. I'm kind of hugging right in between my trap and kind of my own cervical spine. Again, overlapped contact just like our A to the M to L. And in the flexed position at 90 degrees. Pull there. That was pretty good. If I was from this position, just like our iliofemoral joint, it's straight S to I pull from that position. 
should feel pretty comfortable, one, from your palpation, two, because it is the same kind of pull pattern as our S to I in, well, I guess we don't dictate flexion, but S to I the iliofemoral joint. Things to be careful of, it's very easy to embark a lot of force in this position. Once you set it up, you'll feel that I can really pull this joint if I need to. Again, focus on speed. Don't focus on how hard you can pull. Shallow depth, quick adjustments. SI in abduction, we're gonna face the feet for this position. My support hand or lateral hand in this position is going to cradle the humerus. You can see my thumbs on top, my hands are on the bottom. The forearm is generally, generally relaxed and I can get a little bit of distractive force from this position here, and we'll show how that comes into play in just a second. But again, this position, we need to pull on the humerus. We're not pulling on the forearm. Our contact is gonna be a web contact. We're gonna start kind of on the AC joint, then slip off till we're on the, humer the humeral head. That's about as close to that joint as we can get. Once I'm in this position, my body drops low, and I can actually use my support hand to pull a little bit of distraction as I'm pushing here. Once I get set up, my adjustment is just S to I with my medial hand or my contact hand. I'm not pulling out and pushing at the same time. This hand's staying quiet once it gets attention. End range from this position, small push to complete the adjustment there. Again, all of these can be mobilizations. You can start with mobilization, see if you feel comfortable, and then come in if you're not getting enough motion, provide an HVLA for the rest of that area. Questions on SI inflection or SI in abduction? Hi, Daniel. Can we get your help? Anyways, 
if I come here and I push, you can see how much that shoulder girl moves. And going from there and push, it's, it's just too much motion. Questions on PDA? All right, practice those three, then we're going to move into seated G. How this goes. So procedure 87, 88, and 89 are all seated procedures for the GH joint. All of these maneuvers, you can also do standing. We'll show you how to do those in a little bit, but a lot of it depends on your height as a doctor and more so your patient's height as to if you're going to dictate seated and or standing. Obviously, if someone's really tall, seated might be a better position um, just because it brings everything kind of to a neutral level position. Procedure 87 here is everyone's favorite Instagram adjustment for GH. There are some nuances to it. It's not a bad adjustment by any means, but it's not necessarily the one you need to do bilaterally on every patient that walks into your door. Um, but we're going to show you again some of the nuances between this adjustment, how you can kind of customize it for your patient. You have the bad shoulder. That's your bad shoulder. This is your bad shoulder. This is your bad one. You'll work on it some start, and then afterwards you might work on that one. So for our A to P glide, in the picture it shows in a flex position, and then we're pulling from this position here. This is the top end, about as high as you can go, but we can work in a plane all the way down to what I call about kind of 20 to 30 degrees. If you go straight up from the bottom here, what happens if I pull A to B? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit the chromium, I'm gonna jam the glenoid. Also, we can go not only in the flexion vector, but we can also go with a little bit of medial to lateral glide. Small amount, five to 10 degrees, we're not all the way across the body pulling, just inside of that joint. And what we're doing is we're affecting different parts of the capsule as we move the arm into different positions. What we don't want to see is any lateral to medial glides. Why? Yeah, what are we compressing if I go lateral to medial in this position? Labrum, what else? Jam the glenoid fossa, right? That's, it's gonna sit in that angle in that vector. So again, we will see this all the time. People will pull straight from down here. Again, you're gonna jam there. You guys already mentioned slap tears. You better believe your superior part of your labrum is holding on for dear life if you're pushing when the arm's in an inferiorly located position. Does that make sense there? So again, I'd call, probably say 20 degrees is your kind of limiting factor here. 90 degrees is your limiting factor there. And then maybe about five or 10 degrees of medial to lateral glide. So let's even relax there. So just define those borders before we get there. If you set up on your patient during the exam and you're doing an A to P glide from an inferior position, we will stop that exam. Just because it's so unsafe for your patient. All right, so for this position here, it's gonna look kind of like the SC joint. We're gonna use our flank to lock, in this case, the scapula. So not right behind the SC joint. We're actually gonna to try to lock in the scapula from this position. Just like the SC joint, I need to drop my body low enough so I'm behind that contact and I can seal it in. We'll show you a good example and a bad example in a second. Depending on your patient's uh, shoulder and chest width, you might have to change your contact a little bit. We'll kind of show you how to work around that from here, but ideally, you're gonna go around one side of the shoulder with your kind of one hand, and then you're just on the same side of the other hand. So if I block in here, so I'm just going to take contact behind your back, and then my arm's going to come around. Are you okay with that? This arm's going to come up here. We'll kind of start at 90 degrees. If I don't block the scapula and I block more of the thoracic spine, and I come here to push, see how much room there is in the shoulder girdle? If I lock in the scapula, now I press. See how much that isolates that contact? So that's one thing we see all the time when we relax it. That's one thing we see all the time with bad adjustments, is not locking the scapula into place. We're going from a Specific adjustment if we block the scapula, it's a very non-specific adjustment if we don't block the scapula. Again, you'll see that stuff, and now that you guys are probably a little further in the program, you'll think about Instagram chiropractic like I think about Instagram chiropractic. All you can see is what's wrong. Anytime someone sets up, you're like, oh yeah, that's not right. That's why we don't like Instagram chiropractic. It's not that we, whatever, get famous, I don't care. But it's because we see stuff, we're like, oh man, I can't believe they're doing that. <laughs> For our A to P glide, the nice thing about this position is the 
You can kind of scan in the area and see which part of the capsule you want to adjust. Once you find that area, then you're going to pull from anterior to posterior. So same thing, I'm going to take a contact back here, I'm going to come around, we're just going to kind of scan your arm real quick, okay? So arms up here, let your arm drop, I'm going to lock in. I can start from this kind of 20 degree position. I'm just going to kind of scan and see what feels, probably about there, feels most stuck. I'm taking a contact onto the electron. Again, uh, the scapula is locked in to my kind of chest. From here, it's just a small pull anterior posterior to complete that adjustment. Again, you can scan anywhere of these, but the nice thing with this exam is I can kind of check that definitely feels the most stuck. And probably about, maybe about that vector there. So you can kind of customize this as you're doing your palpation, as you're setting up to adjust. So maybe you do your supine palpation, you say I feel a restriction anterior posterior, but I don't know which one, and I prefer the seated method, you can actually scan it in this uh, direction again. Does that make sense? Again, I could do standing for this procedure as well. I almost never do standing because I'm vertically uh, limited in my mm -hmm. abilities. What did you say? Mm -hmm. Did you? <laughs> <You're> fired. <laughs> Just kidding, I would never fire a game. But, absolutely, because I'm, because I'm short, I tend to have my patient seated almost all the time. <laughs> Good question from the crowd. Dr. Miller, can we do the same thing supine? Absolutely. So we just show you A to P in neutral. Theoretically, and we don't show you here because it, it kind of becomes a little bit dangerous as you start to play with the vectors a little bit in, in flexion. But if you remember from CP2, let's have you land your back. Let me grab some space here real quick. Do they learn in CP7? Okay, never mind. I'll put a pin in it. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave something for Dr. Alvarado. But you can, in a supinated, in a, sorry, not supinated, in a supine position, you can do similar adjustments where you play with the vector of that capsule. But again, they are they are a little bit more unsafe, so we do save those for later. All right. Next, we have our S to I glide in either flexion or abduction. Let's have you scoot towards the end of the table here. Normally with my patient, if I have them seated and I'm working on the shoulder outside of the anterior posterior glide, I'm actually going to be turned 90 degrees this way. Perfect. Now I can work on either shoulder and I have a lot of degrees of freedom to move around the table. Obviously anterior posterior, I'm going to have a hard time. Unless I'm on the table, normally I spin the 90 degrees the other way. But just for this, you can, you can face the camera. Just so it's easier, yeah. But normally when I work on the shoulder, even for my orthopedic exams, I have them seated at the end of the table, so I'm able to move around the table 270 degrees without being in the way, or without the table getting in the way for me. For our S to I glides, we need to make sure we're on the humerus. <coughs> You'll see in your picture for, I believe it's abduction, patient's arms up, and the doctor's down here, not on the humerus. What will happen is, as I pull, you'll see the elbow will bend, and it becomes, again, less stable for the patient. So as much as I can, the arm will be in this kind of straight position, but I need to make sure I'm on the humerus as I'm getting ready to pull in this position here. Other things you'll see, I had to drop my body really low to keep the patient in 90 degrees. This is one where you can have the patient stand. Just go ahead and stand up and the same thing face the camera that good. This is one where most of the time I can get away with more of a standing position or a little bit more neutral position for my S to I glide in abduction, S to I glides in flexion. So again, you can kind of see those two positions there. John, can you come up so we can show with John? You will have patients like John that come into your office, you can kind of see on it. So, John's <laughs> the office, and I prefer standing position. I'm going to have to take John. <laughs> I'll take my contact here and keep him at 90 degrees. So for John, let's just have a seat on it. Let's go. <laughs> so for John, I absolutely have to have him seated and I'm going to have to scoot all the way down here. I'm going to have to <laughs> drop my body low later on. Drop. Good. I'm going to have to drop my body low for John because there's no way I can do a standing procedure in that position there. Thank you. All right, so we'll go back here. So again, just to kind of isolate that, depending on your patient's height, you might have to change the position even if you prefer a standing or a seated position. You may or may not have to change that for your patient. All right, let's go back over here, perfect. 
I'm just going to do this the C to one just because it's a little easier to see on camera. So if I'm doing an S to I glide, just like my supine position, I'm going to start kind of on the AC joint. I'm going to take distraction with my hands out uh, proximal to distal. If you don't necessarily need to lean your body away for this one. You'll find when you get your contact, you actually get a ton of tissue slack just using your hands in the right position. My primary contact is going to be a chiropractic index, kind of over a chiropractic index for this position to take and pull. You'll see kind of my hands overlap like this, but my primary contact is my two chiropractic indexes as I'm pulling from proximal to distal. So let's set this one up here, so raise your arm. Good. And again, normally I prefer to stand behind the patient. Um, if it's a case where they're chronic dislocated, but I think they need this procedure, most of the time I put a supine and do a mobilization. But again, if I had to, I might watch their face. But again, I'm going to get really close, closer than I want to for this position here. Right arm drop. Good. I'm going to take just a little bit of tissue slack into external rotation just to make sure the humerus is in the right position. You don't have to do that. We can just spin your arm. There. Good. Right arm drop. Perfect. I'm going to take, I'll just kind of show with one hand just so you can see it. I'm going to start on the AC joint. I'm going to distract away from the patient's midline right onto the humeral head. Once I'm in this position, try to get as much of my hands out of the way as I can, I can pull S to I. So again, if I start here, pull from proximal to distal, S to I in this position here. The important things again, I'm on the humerus with my shoulder, and the arm is rested at 90 degrees. They're not up past or down below. For a flexion move, arm's gonna come in front, kind of just like they're making flexion. Good. Arm's going to rest on my shoulder again, here, and I'll take that same kind of chiropractic index contact onto the humeral head. Just a little distraction away from the patient with my hands, body stays the same. i got to drop low, so I'm at 90, and then pulling from superior to inferior. Again, very powerful moves in the standing position or seated position. Very easy to kind of use your body weight to pull the patient down. As much as we can. Once the body's, once their arms locked down on your body, just to pull down towards yourself, not dropping your body in that position. Questions on those three? Yeah, it doesn't matter if the arms necessarily flexed or bent for this position, as long as you're on the humerus, um, whatever the patient's comfortable with. Good. All right, practice those three. So again, make sure you orient yourselves correctly first, so you're not being lost in translation. Our first procedure, our restriction within the long axis, the elbow is going to stay bent. Normally by the side is the one that you'll see the most with the arm kind of 90 degrees. My support hand is going to be an inverse web contact onto the humerus. And with my contact hand on the ulna, I'm going to try to get as close to the joint as possible. Maybe scoot, just sit at the table, maybe. As close to the joint line as possible. Depending on the size of your patient's forearms and the size of your hand, you might be further away. Again, you want to get as close to that joint as possible, probably about as close as I can get and still have a good grip. So if I'm in this neutral position, I'll try to keep myself out of the way as much as I can. Inverted web contact. I'm going to drop my forearm and pull within that long axis along the shaft of the ulna. You'll see sometimes docs raise the arm up. The important thing to know when you raise the arm up, everything's still oriented in that 90 degree position. So the elbow's still bent at 90. My forearm is still along the line of the ulna. So I wouldn't drop my elbow below that line to go 90 degrees relative to the patient. I'm doing 90 degrees relative to the ulna here. Again, the easiest way arm at the side and pulling straight out. But if you have to get in a position like this, just make sure you orient yourself correctly to pull within the long axis along the plane line of the ulna. What don't we do with long axis distraction that we do with most of the other uh, elbow procedures? What does the patient not do? Oh, uh, distraction. Yeah, so again, most of our procedures later on, we're gonna have the patient <laughs> A way to create some more tension in that joint, create a little bit of distraction. Long axis is the one where we do not do that. 
So if I grab a hold here and I have my patient lean away, I lose my contact point onto the humerus. So again, make sure to keep that in mind there. If we're going to set up the adjustment, grab a hold here, get my body in the right position, pull within that long axis, and it's a small HVLA adjustment with just my contact hand. Normally within the long axis, I find a little bit better uh, treatment protocols if I can just move it a little bit. Because it's so hard to grab the ulna, unless someone has a really small form, you have a very good grip strength, to get a good mobilization on that with just one HVLA contact. Does that make sense? All right, next, scoot a little bit more to your perfect right there. Next we have our uh, ADP glide in flexion. <clears throat> This procedure, your foot's going to go on the table, so my foot's going to be resting on the table, and then your arm's going to rest on my leg. Are you okay with that? All right. For this procedure, the next thing you have to keep in mind is, as we lift the patient's arm up and rest it on your thigh, that they're in a relatively neutral or 90 degree position. I shouldn't say neutral, but a 90 degree flex position. If you're not meaning you have a long arm and they're way up here, you're going to have to kind of lengthen your leg out just a little bit to make sure they're in the proper orientation to get the patient in that kind of 90 degree flex position. Let's go just a little bit in. No, you're fine. You stay here. Good. I'm going to take a digit contact onto the ulna, tissue slack from lateral to medial. I can flex the elbow and then you're going to lean away just a little bit. Good, right there. Just enough to kind of feel that distracted force. I raise my forearm up so I can pull along that kind of plane line of the joint. If you don't like a digit contact here, you can also use a knife edge contact similar to our P to A fibula for that pump handle procedure. Tissue slack medial to lateral, A to P, flex, patient's going to lean away a little bit, and I can use that knife edge to pull towards me as well. So either one are fair game. The big thing here is getting our tissue slack enough medial to lateral to support that ulna, get a little bit of tissue to make it comfortable for the patient, flex the arm, and then the patient leans away, and we have to get our form in line from here, end range, small pull to complete that adjustment. One thing to note is with your support hand, you want to be at the distal aspect of the elbow so you have good control of the patient's forearm. If I take a contact with both hands down low and I flex the patient's arm, you can see as I go to pull, go and lean away just a little bit. As I go to pull, there's no counter force, so I can kind of just pull this whole thing open. So make sure that support hand is up high. And I'm just pulling. We're not doing a counter motion where both are moving. Support hand stays steady. Contact hand, small pull. Questions with those? Two procedures. Easy. All right. Practice those two. All right. Last one. We have our posterior anterior glide. We have multiple contacts for this. So if we go back to our, I was going to turn it over just to show the contact first. If we go back to our kind of CP2 contact. This is my favorite contact still. We have this kind of curled index on either side of the electron on to push posterior to anterior. Again, this isn't a normal position of the elbow, I'm just showing the contact. We'll take it to the actual setup in just a second. We also have a donut contact, so your hand's going to kind of look like this. I'm going to give you kind of an okay sign to start just to show we're kind of around the electron on, so we're not putting any pressure on that. Very pointy prominence. We also have a shelf contact where we kind of make this pinch grip contact. And then the electron will fit right into that point as well as we push P to A. Okay, you can play with all of these and see which one you like the most. We'll show you this way first. I think it's the most comfortable for me as a practitioner and the safest for the patient. Curled index contact onto the electron. You're going to lean away just a little bit right there first. And then I'm taking it to end range, that kind of extended position. Then from here, it's a small little radial deviation with a little bit of a bicep flexion moment. So here, small motion there. I don't know if this one, maybe the other one, see the other one. Yeah, it's better. 
lean away a little bit. A little less. Get it right there. From here, pop. Again, most of these adjustments are small motions. You may or may not hear a pop of some of these elbow. You can, especially get to the radius here, kind of those loud pops. But the biggest thing is we get to that extended point and range, small push from there. If we get to our other contacts, the shelf and the uh, donut contact, as opposed to bracing the patient's arm against our body, it becomes a little bit more of a long lever. Let's try to get out of the way. It becomes a little bit more of a long lever contact from here. If this one kind of is ready to pop a little bit. But it gets, you really need to control your patient with this. So it's not from here, and it's this big whipping motion. <coughs> End range, small push to complete the adjustment. If we're using a shelf contact, same idea. From here, small push to complete that adjustment. So we're not doing this big whipping motion and kind of breaking over our arm using the forearm or the long lever. Does that make sense? Okay, try those three contacts, your L to M and M to L pushes, and we'll come I did three. Yep. Lateral medium flat. I'll get out of the way for most of it and show you the setup and I'll kind of block the camera for just a second. Maybe we'll have to change the view, we'll see. For our lateral to medial glide, so go ahead and flip your arm over there. Good. What do we have to worry about the lateral side if we're going to contact the ulna? Not the ulna, that's on the medial side. The radius, absolutely. So if I come in with just a general web MCT contact, I'm mostly on the radius, not a lot on the ulna. Maybe I'll go, let me see if that works real quick. What I like to do, and eventually with our support angle show, you're going to stabilize the medial joint structures just like we did for the knee. I like to put my fourth and fifth finger on either side, kind of the electron. And then when I take my contact, I'm going to go in between my fingers. That'll just kind of give me a nice landing zone every time to make sure I'm not on the radius at all. And I kind of have somewhere to go. Sorry, just turn your shoulder go again. With the electron contact, you want to make sure you're not necessarily equal with the joint line. So as we grab, <laughs> so I have my contact. I'm going to be just, you kind of see the humerus articulating here, just inferior to that point on kind of the blade of the electron. This will be a little bit different when we show P to A later, too. But again, we're going to be just kind of distal to that joint line. Just something to keep in mind as we're doing our lateral to medial. Okay, we'll see what happens as we set this up, how much of the camera I block. I'm going to have to change things. With a lateral to medial glide, I'm going to stabilize their form along my plank. Elbow's going to be in a relatively extended position. Maybe let's scoot in and go overhead. I don't know. Or maybe maybe turn this way. Let's see if this is better. Yeah, yeah that's better. So I'm going to stabilize the medial structures of the elbow in kind of this relatively extended position. We'll show the contact in just a second on the other side. Once I have my contact in place, I'm going to have the patient lean back just a little bit to create that tension. And I need to take the patient out of terminal extension. So kind of in a 5 to 10 degree bend, my elbow comes out so I can push across that joint line. Again, big thing to keep in mind, you might start extended as they lean back to create distraction. So they need to break that plane line of the joint. Take it out of terminal extension and tune to kind of 10 degrees. And then we're going to push across. We'll show the contact on the other side here. So if I have the patient supported here, you'll see my fourth and fifth digits are kind of around the electron. I like to take a MCP contact right onto that. Get my fat hand out of the way as best I can. Right onto that electron. You'll see some people sometimes use kind of like a, almost like a shelf contact. Same thing, but most comfortable for me is that MCP contact and the rest of my arm is around kind of the radius, but when I push, I'm pushing through the MCP and not through the web into the radius. Does that make sense? All right, so one more time. 
arms up, take my tissue slack, lateral to medial, onto that joint structure, lean away just a little bit, good, right there's fine. Add a terminal extension, drop my elbow low so I can come along the plane line of the joint. All right, it's all out of the way. So if you're up here, you're kind of more so on the radius when you push. If I drop low, now I'm pushing straight across the electron. End range, small push to complete that adjustment. Questions about the L to M glide. Okay, the biggest thing is making sure you're off the radius. If we come to the other side, it will start here first. If we do our medial to lateral glide, I'm going to have to stand kind of on the inside of the patient to stabilize. So we're going to be a little bit closer this time. If you're uncomfortable, let me know, okay? Same thing, stabilize the lateral joint structures this time. Fingers still kind of all around that olecranon. It's easier for me to control flexion and extension. It gives me the same kind of landing point every time. If we show the contact hand now, stabilize here. Keep the arm in a relatively supinated position. You can be a little bit more uh, free with your contact here, more of a web, because you'll be able to be strictly on the electron arm. I still like to use my MCP primarily because I get a good handle onto the ulna. In relative terminal extension, lean away, right there's perfect. Take them out, drop the elbow low, and push straight across that joint. One thing to keep in mind with the medial to lateral glide is if you don't have good control of the arm, it's very easy for the patient to start winging and rotating. If you feel like as you're pushing medial to lateral, that patient starts kind of winging out, readjust your support hand first, make sure you kind of lock everything in, and then come back in and see if you can get that contact. That makes sense, that happens, we see that a lot, where you're not supporting the arm enough, maybe they're in a pronated position, or kind of a neutral position where the elbow is able to kind of freely bend more so, as opposed to this kind of supinated position where it locks the joint out. Again, we see that relatively common, that's why I bring it up. Questions on the medial to lateral glide. All right, last one, we have our posterior to anterior glide. We have multiple. procedures here. You've seen both of these procedures just a few minutes ago. <laughs> Only difference is that our contact is the radius versus the ulna. In this position here, we have a restriction within the long axis. Everything's the same. The only thing that changes is my hand contact. Before, my lateral hand was I'll stabilizing the humerus. My medial hand was pulling on the Hold on. Oh, so now I have to cool. bring my body around. Bring my body out of the way just for a second. But normally I'm going to finish somewhere in here to pull. <laughs> but just like the long axis distraction for our humeral <laughs> ulnar joint, I'm trying to get as close <laughs> to this joint line as possible. And again, for me it's about midway up. Normally I find I have a little bit harder time on the lateral side getting a good contact on that bone. From this position, arms at the side, inverted web contact, distracting, and pulling away. One thing I'll show just because I probably didn't do a good enough job explaining it before, is when you're taking your contact onto either the ulna or the radius, I like to use a pinch grip, so I pinch my thin arm and my digits over that bone. So I'm kind of taking a grip here onto the bone, trying to squeeze that bone as best I can. Again, depending on your patient, depending on the size of your hands and your grip strength, you're going to be somewhere along the shaft line of the radius. For our A to B inflection, same kind of idea. Get my arm down a little bit here. Now I'm on the radial side. Either a digit contact or a knife edge contact. Obviously my hands switch, so now my lateral hand is my contact, my medial hand is my support hand. Tissue slack, flex the arm, patient leans away, raise my arm up to match that 
angle of the joint, and pulling anterior posterior. Again, I could use a knife edge, flex, lean away, get right there, and then pull anterior posterior. Okay, you guys can kind of play with those. Take maybe five minutes on those, and then we'll do the proximal radial ulnar joint. Good. We are done. We're going to cover the proximal radial ulnar joint. One thing to mention from the previous AFP inflection adjustments we were seeing before, we saw enough of them to mention now. As the elbow is flexed in this position, and I'm taking my contact over, that is all I'm doing with my support hand. Then I'm pulling with either a digit or knife edge contact. It's not like the pump handle and then I take my tension and my thrust is from both hands. Quiet support hand once I get to that tension point and then pulling with either a digit or knife edge contact. So we do not want to see a pump handle like action in the elbow. For our proximal radial ulnar joint, we have kind of a few different ways to do this. It's dictated as a push in your manual there's also a full procedure for each of A to P and P to A in more of a neutral position. For this procedure, you're going to have your palm facing towards the ceiling, and then you're going to sit on your hand. Perfect, right there. What this allows me to do is create tension into the joint and stabilize it. If I need more tension, the patient can laterally flex away while sitting on their hand to create some tension into this joint. Come back for a while. In a Let's see, let's start with P to A, because I'm here. In a P to A push procedure, my stabilization hand is going to hold on to the electron, and I'm going to take a thumb contact, or hypothenar contact, onto the radial head. For my patient here, this is kind of end range. I've got to be lean away. Right there, good. Stabilize, and now I'm pushing posterior to anterior, with this case a thumb, or a hypothenar contact. For the A to P, now I seem to stand in front of my patient, and oftentimes I'll kind of stand in a contralateral side, so I get a good plane line to the radial head. They will show the push first, and we'll show the pull second. So as I set up for a A to P glide, medial hand is going to be my support hand, I'm going to come on the electron here. And as much as I can, I'm going to use either a thumb or a hypothenar contact to come in anterior posterior on that joint. Depending on your patient's orientation, I'll try to get out of the way as much as I can. I might not be able to. But I can come in front of the patient here and take my contact with my hypothenar. I don't know if you can see any of this because I'm in the way. Something like that. <laughs> as, best, as best I can. <laughs> From the contralateral side for a P to A glide, I can perform a pull procedure as well. So a digit pull onto the posterior aspect of the uh, uh, radial head. I find the pushes are a lot easier, but you may see these pulls. They are, for me, a little bit awkward. I think it's like short lift. But I'm supporting patient lanes where I can take a digit contact here for a P to A, or if I'm doing A to P, support, and I can take a digit contact anterior, posterior, and pull. Again, I prefer to do pushes because I feel like I have more control, but you will see those out in the field. Last, we have everyone's favorite elbow adjustment, I think. This is our P to A glide in pronation. I'm going to show you a couple, and then Dr. Smith is going to show you kind of his quick scan screen. This arm's going to come out. So we have our P to A in pronation. What does that dictate for the patient's position? The better be in pronation, right? <laughs> so pre-position and pronation. You'll be surprised. Last, we have everyone's favorite elbow adjustment, I think. This is our P to A glide in pronation. I'm going to show you a couple, and then Dr. Smith is going to show you kind of his quick scan screen. This arm is going to come out. So we have our P to A in pronation. What does that dictate for the patient's position? The better be in pronation, right? <laughs> so pre-position and pronation. You'll be surprised how many of you guys will forget that. 
<laughs> but in a pronated position, I'm going to rest the arm against my flank in this pronated position. And then from here, maybe let's go overhead. Scoot to your left up towards the headpiece. Perfect. From this position, I can either take a thumb contact similar to my palpation and push in that curvilinear motion, or I can take a hypothenar contact and same idea, push into that curvilinear motion. I have a lot of control of the pronation of the patient's forearm and a good contact from this pronated position. I don't know if I want to show, should I show the other thing or no? Okay. Dr. Meadow, would you like to show your Which? assessment? Yes. Oh, wait. Let me talk about the Okay, I can from this position, stand for me, go in and assess the patient's PDA glide and pronation with my thumb contact, just like we did before, lean back a little bit for me, okay. come around, okay, sure enough, a little stuck there. I can correct that using the hypothenar contact Dr. Miller was talking mm -hmm. about, and I'm having sick, you are a little bit shorter than I am, okay, so I can get a little lower, turn this way. So I like to really keep that shoulder at about 90 degrees of uh, shoulder flexion. He's in the pronated position. You can see the hand there supporting underneath. With my support hand, I'm going to have my fingers wrap around sort of the anti-brachium right here and sort of pre-position it to a little bit more pronation. Watch the shoulder that I don't start internally rotating the shoulder. You see that? I can keep cranking him, but then we're just going to get internal rotation here. So I'm just kind of taking the slack out of everything already with my support hand. Hypothenar eminence is going to go over the top. I'm walking in from medial to lateral and P to A off that radial hand. He's going to lean back to distract the joint. Stop right there. And then from that position, I can take him all the way in range and then go through the adjustment in that curvilinear line of drive. What you didn't see me do is just hyperextend by pushing down into the elbow. I went around over the top of the uh, two joints. Okay? So now we can go in. We didn't get a big audible release, but Back. Now we can go, you guys can see that oh wow. motion oh, yeah. is now symmetrical, okay? So it's a really good tool because <laughs> the patient might not necessarily feel the lack of P to A glide in a permanent position, but they can see that incre increase in the range of motion pretty dramatically, okay? That would be the time now that we restore that range of motion to go work on some of our uh, extensor strengthening exercises using you know the soft weights and things like that going through concentric contraction with the slow eccentric load we talked about that a little bit in FRS right try to build up some of that strength or some of the rice bucket or sandbox work to build up some of those uh, extensors and flexors okay so treat in two different positions so we're going to have treatment in a pronated position and treatment in a supinated position we need to dictate that as we are can't see. Okay. <laughs> Doing your adjustments. For all of these adjustments, we're going to stabilize the ulna and move the radius in that position. For our first, we'll start in the supinated position first. It's a little bit easier. For these, for these procedures, I'm going to take a kind of pinch grip contact. So I'm going to, in between my thenar eminence, and my digits, I'm gonna kind of give just a squeeze, just a general squeeze to hold on to that structure. I'm gonna support the patient's elbow on my knee. Try to get my shoulder out of the way. I'm gonna stabilize, again, stabilize the only in that position. And I'm gonna take the same kind of pinch grip with my thenar and digits onto the radius. I'm not moving the ulna, I'm not shearing both at once. I'm stabilizing the ulna, and now I'm moving the radius about the ulna. If I wanted to do a A to P glide, would I dictate that as a push or a pull in this position? 
pull. So I pull towards me. <coughs> so A to P glide in a supinated position. We have a P to A push in the supinated position. Then I can flip the hand around. Stabilize again that ulna. Pinch grip, DNR, first and second digit onto the radius. And if I pull, which glide am I doing? P to A glide in pronation. And then I also have a push for an A to P in a pronated position. Obviously, you're going to palpate both of these positions, A to P, P to A, as you assess the distal radial ulnar joint. Questions about A to P or P to A in supination or pronation? Not too bad, pretty straightforward. Again, if you remember CP2, and hopefully you've been going to open lab and brushing up on those uh, palpations, if you're remembering your precision from CP2, a lot of these are going to go downhill pretty quick. Next, we have our uh, intercarpal adjustments. For all these procedures, they're going to be the patient's going to be in a pronated position with the hand. Close enough. <laughs> I'm going to take a pinch grip or a grip contact with my hands kind of generally around the wrist. I'm just mentioning this beforehand because it's going to be hard to see what I do, but we're going to take a little bit of distraction away. So the first one's going to be a uh, proximal to distal glide restriction. Oftentimes, I'll kind of use my hand. I'll start with an overlap. And as I take my tissue slack, I'll kind of bring my hands together and almost kind of do that kind of little spaghetti breaker move. And that will create that distraction. I'm only showing this on the camera now because as I do it on the patient, it's going to look like I'm doing this the whole time without really too much motion in there. But I want to kind of try to articulate that as best I can before we show you and you can't see anything. If we're looking at the carpals, especially their relationship with the radius, if someone extends their wrist, where does that happen? Does that happen at the radial carpal, intercarpal, or metacarpal carpal joint? Someone extends their wrist. Radial carpal. What about flexion? Intercarpal. Very good. Not radial carpal. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so if I take my contact here, in this position we're always going to stabilize the proximal row and we're going to move the distal row. So my hand on, my, on the proximal side is staying quiet once I get that pinch grip and then now I'm moving my distal hand about that. When you're taking your contacts, you want to try to get your line of drive as straight as possible. So let's say I do a P to A glide. I don't want to see the wrist necessarily flex as I'm doing a P to A glide. I'm distracting, and it's a straight P to A push. Does that make sense? That'll happen sometimes, especially L to M and M to L. It's very easy to kind of radi force uh, ulnar deviation or force radial deviation. You want to distract away and then push straight across that plane. But we're going to start with our proximal to distal glide. Let's go, maybe we'll have you sit and face me this way. Sorry, camera. Yeah, just a little bit up. Sorry. This isn't going to be an ideal position for me. I'll kind of drop in a little bit later just to try to show this as best I can. So I'm going to stabilize proximal row. Grab onto the distal row. And you'll see just a little bit of distraction there. And my P to A glide is just that. I can drop my arms and just pull a little bit. It doesn't take a lot of force and distraction to move this joint. This is very movable carpal bones. Oftentimes, just gripping onto the wrist with both hands, you're going to feel that distractive force. So be careful with your friends. Don't try to rip their wrist off their uh, forearm. If I'm in this position, I'm going to block the camera just for a second. From here, stabilize and then pull with my distal hand to assess P to egg line. Often these procedures are better as mobilization, but you absolutely can stabilize and give a little HBLA pull. But oftentimes you'll find as you take that grip contact, just moving into that plane of motion is going to give you enough range of motion. Long axis, right? Not P-day. Long axis. Sorry, did I said P-day. Yeah. Proximal to distal. I apologize. Proximal to distal. I apologize. P to D. We'll do P to A next. In this position, now I'm going to take my same grip, distract away proximal to distal, and from this point I'm pushing straight P to A. So my proximal hand to the patient isn't moving, my distal hand is the one that's pushing P to A. If I need to do A to P, I'm pulling up towards myself. M to L, 
pushing from the ulnar side. Same thing, distract away, try to push straight across onto L, L to M, pull away, pull towards me, L to M. Again, any of these segments you find, you could do a HVLA adjustment in that area. Again, oftentimes I find mobilizations work very well in that wrist procedure because they're already so movable. Questions about those nine procedures? How do I find the lunate from this position as a doctor? I have a patient here. How do I find the lunate? What's my landmark? Lister's tubercle, right? So I'm going to find Lister's tubercle on the distal radius. Take tension down into slightly medial. And that's going to take me right onto the lunate. Pretty surefire way to get onto that bone. How do I find the scaphoid from this position? Go radially or laterally. I'll be on the scaphoid. What's another way to find the scaphoid? Anatomical snuff box, bring your thumb up. Good, right there. And if I go to the base of that snuff box, surefire way to find the scaphoid. How do I find the distal row of carpals? What can I do? Yeah, metacarpal head. Pretty surefire way to find those. I'm just going to trace those. Oftentimes when I'm palpating these, I'm leaving my thumb down. I'm waiting for that little dip where the joint comes in, boom. I can grab the metacarpal, do my wiggle test, right? That's still moving, a little bit more proximal. Now I'm on that proximal carpal. Which carpal lines up with the fourth and fifth digits of the hand? Hamate, absolutely. And I can check that with the hook of the hamate on the volar side. What about the third metacarpal? Capitate, second. Trapezoid, first. Trapezium, good. So again, if you need to review those, we're happy to review those with you. I'm not going to go through each individual one because we got a lot to cover today. So we're just going to generally, we'll just kind of start with the lunate. Let me erase this table a little bit just for the angle. Unless maybe uh, overhead, do you think, for these? Let's switch overhead. Scoot to your left a little bit. Yeah, all right. So if I find Lister's tubercle, I come off. I say straddle the table. Straddle. Straddle. Let's switch around. Let's move a lower this. Scoot backwards in that piece. One more. Good. All right. So if I find the lunate here, we're going to take a thumb over thumb contact for all of these. <laughs> it might, it may or may not work. Let's see. One. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So we have our thumb over thumb contact. In this position, I'm assessing P to A glide in neutral. What other position do I need to check? Radial and ulnar deviation. P to A glide. PA glide, then I can take my pinch grip, flip over, replace with my thumb. Same thing, A to P in neutral, A to P in ulnar deviation, A to P in radial deviation. Do we have generally more ulnar or generally more radial deviation? Ulnar, right? Because you're going to have this uh, radius in the way one and you have that far fiber cartilage on the outside, so you get a little bit more range there. It has to do with kind of articulation of the scaphoid and the radius. In this position, as I take my tension onto the patient's, in this case, lunate, I can either have the patient lean away from me, lean away a little bit, to take tissue slack onto that section, and come back towards me, relax. Oftentimes what I'll do is I'll take tissue slack, proximal to distal, and on my back side with my fingers, I'm kind of distracting the patient's carpals away from the wrist in that position. So sometimes you'll see docs in more of a neutral position and kind of grip the hand. For me, sorry, sorry to move too much. For me, I often find in this position, if I just kind of grip and use my hands to distract, that's enough force for me. Starting out, I recommend taking your contact and having the patient lean away just a little bit. Right there is good. Just to create that distractive force for you. But you will see docs, you can come back towards me. 
you will see Dasha's kind of grab the wrist and move from there. It's not that they're not taking tissue slack and distracting, it's just they're using their hands to create that force. So something to keep in mind there. So we have our P to A glide. Actually, not moving too much. You might if I push this one just a little bit. So in this position here, I can either take the patient to end range and use a small tricep extension to push, or if I want to modulate my depth a little bit, I can use my own leg as kind of a landing point for this position. The advantage to this is I can push a little bit faster and not quite as controlled because I have a landing point to stop my force. If I don't do that and I take them all the way down here and I push, I can hyperextend the wrist and stress these structures on the opposite side, or I can just push too hard and damage the structure I'm actually on. So this landing point is a good position to kind of stop yourself from pushing too far. What's another strategy that you guys learned last week with Dr. Cimento you could implement in the same area too? Tooling board. board, absolutely. I could use a Tooling board. Oftentimes I'm gonna bring something up to where the patient's in kind of a neutral position. Sometimes go ahead and stand up. Sometimes I'll have the patient stand. You have a table that raises all the way. I can raise the table up. And now with the patient here, this is actually still too short for you. From this position, I could land onto the tooling board. Oh, sorry, scoot up. Uh, let's come around this way. Yeah. Out of throw. From this position, I can push onto a tooling board as well. This table's too low for him. I'm liking to kind of a 90 degree bend where I'm pushing and stopping that force. But absolutely a speeder board or tooling board is a great tool to use in these kind of distal extremities, either tarsal bones or carpal bones. Increases your speed limit a little lower. And same thing, straddle table facing this way. Really good tool in this area. In this position here, I'm going to do a P to A glide for him. It's just a P to A glide in neutral. I'm going to use that same distractive <laughs> force, lean away just a little bit. Right there is perfect. And I'm just going to take the end range, small push in that position there. Easy as that, a little bit more distraction. Good. Simple, easy. You're going to find it doesn't take a lot of force to move these joints. It's more about, again, that speed. I think we already got too much from setting you up because you're all crunching there. So again, that's a P to A strategy. If I was going to do an A to P strategy, I just need to supinate the wrist and find a restricted carpal in either neutral, ulnar, or radial deviation. Then if you were to do this procedure for your midterm ex or your final exam, you would name a P to A glide in either neutral, radial, or ulnar deviation of named bone. So you don't have to do scaphoid on lunate, it's just scaphoid or lunate or whatever it might be. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, mm, I'll show you one more just because I don't want to run out of time on myself. The next one we're going to do is a very easy one. This is just metacarpal shear. So we're going to take each individual metacarpal and kind of move it against its neighboring partner. If we're looking at the Metacarpal, or yes, metacarpals in general. Do we have more motion laterally or more motion medially? Are these bones more movable or less movable as we go from lateral to medial or medial to lateral? So our medial bones are a little bit more movable. My fourth and fifth metacarpals are more movable than my second and third. Why is that? Yeah. Between my metacarpals, they move about each other. Is it more movable on the second and third, or is it more movable on the fourth and fifth? Fourth and fifth. Why? Not the thumb, not the retinaculum. What do you have to do with your hand? So if I'm gripping something, I need to kind of use my hand to grip around things. So I need to be a little bit more movable here to kind of, on the opposite side of the thumb, to get a full grip on something. What's the functional position of the hand? Not neutral. Slight extension. Slight what? Ulnar deviation. What do my fingers do? So slight extension, 
slight older deviation, and flexion of the digits. That's the functional position of the hand. If you look at that functional position of the hand, you'll see the fourth and fifth digits naturally want to kind of uh, oppose in that position to create a little bit more grip. Sorry. <laughs> in this position. So again, you can kind of, should be able to kind of grip your own finger there, and that's the fourth and fifth digit, and the theme are it's coming together. So you should be a little bit more movable on the medial aspect of your hand, that's normal. One thing we didn't talk about with the hand, in the arches we have feet, arches, in the foot we have arches, we also have arches in the hand. Do you guys remember those? If you could review that before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One arch lives around the carpals. One arch will live on the heads of the metacarpals, going from either way. And then you have arches that run along the rays, just like kind of your plantar fascia in your foot. So very similar, but again, if we're creating stability in the hand, if I kind of bring that hand together with that slight extension, slight all deviation, strong position for the hand. Let's see, for, for proximal transverse arch, distal transverse arch, longitudinal arch. Yeah, proximal transverse, distal transverse, and longitudinal oh, arch. Simple, simplified by Dr. Semeno. <laughs> All right, so with our individual metacarpals, we can shear the, let's face the camera this way. So I actually need to get this position so you're like that. So we're going, we're going west. Okay. So we're gonna hold the patient in a supinated position and to individually shear these metacarpals, I'm gonna use that same kind of pinch grip that you guys saw on the distal radial ulnar joint. So we're gonna hold one of my metacarpals will start with the second, so I'm going to hold as many as I can. So I'm going to hold three through four, three through five, with that kind of pinch grip contact. And I'm going to take a pinch grip on the second and just shear P to A, A to P. Then I'm going to go to the third. I'm just going to stabilize the fourth and fifth because they tend to be more movable anyways. And now I'm going to go A to P, P to A. As soon as I get to the fourth, I'm going to switch. So I'm going to stabilize the lateral portion, move four about three, mm -hmm. and then five about four. I'm just checking side to side to see if I feel any restrictions generally. Sorry. If I feel any restrictions generally, side to side. It's hurt? Okay. Alright, from that position. What's wrong? You're good? Look at me like I'm upset. Alright, so again, in these shear positions, these are just mobilizations, and I'm just trying to find which one's not moving. In this case, it's kind of three on four or four on three. So I'm going to stabilize, and now I'm just going to take a pinch grip and move that A to B, P to A in a shearing force just to try to loosen up. The hand. Oftentimes I'll use this as kind of a quick move and a quick scan to see generally how the hand is moving, generally how the muscles and fascia are moving in the hand. So practice the individual carpals and then the shearing and then we have plenty more for you today including some bonus moves from Drs. McCallum and Cermeno. So practice those maybe these positions, just like our intercarpals, we're going to start with an extraction moment or a proximal to distal moment. The key for these is we're going to stabilize the proximal joint partner. We're going to stabilize the proximal joint partner and then we're going to move the distal joint partner. For the metacarpal phalangeal joint, we're stabilizing the metacarpal and we're moving the phalange. I'm just taking a general kind of pinch grip on the phalange. On the bottom side, I'm just using a pinch contact to stabilize as best I can. From this position, my first uh, procedure is proximal to distal. So I can take it here. If I need to do an adjustment, it's just a quick little pulse. In this position, we can also do P to A. So distract away, push down P to A. 
A to P, distract away, push up towards me and A to P. I can also do medial and lateral glides. So again, referencing the radius and ulna. If I distract away, I push here, I'm going lateral to medial. Distract away, push there, medial to lateral. And then I can also do my external rotation and internal rotation. For the interphalangeal joints, if I need to do the proximal interphalangeal joint, and this is well, really middle because this is proximal, but anyways. If I stabilize the proximal phalange, grip onto the middle phalange, same idea, distract away, A to P, P to A, M to L, L to M, external, internal rotation. I can do the same thing distally, grabbing the middle phalanx and the distal phalanx. Same thing, distract, proximal to distal, A to P, P to A, M to L, L to M, external, internal rotation. You can do that for any of the joints here. And then obviously you have your uh, interphalangeal joint of the thumb as well. We have specific ones we can show you kind of here. The big thing to keep in mind with the thumb, really any of the fingers is, you also have those collateral ligaments. So making sure you're not doing like a valgus force as you're doing M to L or L to M. So you can stress those ligaments, valgus or varus force I should say. But again, any of these positions, and these are very easy. If I find one that's not moving, if I find one, do you mind if I give this a little pull? If I find this one that's not moving, I'm just stabilizing, and then I just find the direction, distract, and then pull. Very easy. It doesn't take a lot of force for any of these. If they're going to go, they're going to go pretty easy. Thumb will have Dr. McCallum show you in just a second. Questions on those 14 adjustments? Yeah, very easy. Well, it's actually 14 times 7, whatever that is. They have all the different ones. You just learned 80 adjustments there. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny, but it's true. You go, you go bilaterally. Uh, the next procedure we'll show you is the um, thumb procedure. Well, let's get this one out of the way. If you look in your manual, it's described as a proximal to distal glide restriction. I mentioned this because a common fault with this procedure is to push straight P to A. And if you push straight P to A, you can really have to worry about these ligaments in your thumb here and damaging them. So for the proximal to distal glide of the first metacarpal carpal joint, I'm going to take kind of the thumb and grip the thenar eminence with my first and second digits. And my thumb is going to be right on top, just distal to the trapezium. I'm going to reinforce with the hypothenar contact. And I'm going to bring my body towards my patient. I'm going to block their humerus a little bit with my own arm. From this position, sorry, I'll wait. <laughs> From this position, I can push straight out away from me, and that helps to limit the stress on that joint versus, in this position, pushing P to A down. So we want to take it here and distract out away. Yeah. You'll see docs do from this kind of angle here, and they'll take and grip, and they'll push, and they'll call it the same move. Again, this is more of a P to A, if I was going to do a long axis from this position, I have to bring my body way over the top to create that same amount of leverage and force. Does that make sense? But the ideal way in this class is thumb, reinforce hypothenar, drive next to the patient so I can pull straight away there. Questions on the first mm -hmm. carpal metacarpal restriction within the long axis or proximal distal glide? Good. Practice those fingers and thumbs, and then we'll have the bonus moves for you from Dr. Cimento and Dr. McCallum. Thank you. I'll show you four, and then Dr. Cimento will show you some as well. So they're not in the manual, but they are good, so just keep that in mind.
So the first two I'm going to talk about are for the distal radial ulnar joint. Okay. Sometimes you need to create more compression. Am I on camera? Yeah. Sometimes you need to create more compression or decrease the amount of space. Sometimes you need to increase the amount of space, right, and distract there. Okay. So the two moves I'm going to show you have to do with that. So I'll show you the moves first, and then I'll show you what Dr. Wanless once showed me about some soft tissue that kind of helps supplement that if you do it first. But I'm just going to show you first. Okay? Uh, can I roll this up a bit more? Okay, so if I'm going to decrease or compress the distal radial ulnar joint, I'm going to have their arm in this neutral position, not supinated or pronated. I'm going to grab at the distal radial ulnar joint, but a little bit more proximal so that my hand can grab around. And I have my thenar on the radius, and then my hand's just kind of gripping around the uh, ulna, okay? And then I'm going to reinforce like so. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be approximating my thenar and fingers to create that compression at that distal radial ulnar joint. You don't want to be too far up because then you're not going to actually influence that joint, but you don't want to be over the carpal, so make sure you're just uh, proximal to that joint. I'm going to come in and reinforce. I'm going to distract a little bit or have them lean back, but enough that you still have control, okay? So we don't want her leaning back so far that I no longer have control. But with this move, it's important that you realize you're not like thrusting down, you're doing almost just like a distraction and a little impulse. Okay, so you're doing like a squeeze thrust versus like a whip. Okay, don't whip their arm. So I'm coming in here, I'm taking that tension, I'm gonna distract, I'm squeezing, and then I'm just impulsing. Does that make sense? <laughs> versus, if I'm trying to create space in that distal radial ulnar joint, you can supinate the arm. You can take thumb contact, so my medial hand is actually going to go on the radius side, so I'm crossing over, and then my lateral hand is going on the ulnar side, so I'm making like a crisscross like so. We can try it overhead and see. Okay, that'll work. Okay, so crisscross applesauce. And then, we're also going to be distracting or having them lean back. My hands are kind of supporting on the posterior side. And then I'm going to be pushing outwardly like so. Okay? So I'm coming in here. That's not fresh, right? Okay, good. I'm like pushing on it. Okay, so I'm coming in here. I'm going to have either her lean back or I distract. Then I'm thrusting like so. Okay? It feels pretty nice. So this would be, I'm trying to separate, I'm not separating, I'm trying to create space. So one of the ways that you can do that, that Dr. Wallace told me, is if you're going to that, that kind of like inner space, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, we can actually pull that tissue, uh, can we maybe go overhead? I can distract like that to create more space versus if I'm trying to create compression, I can kind of activate that musculature and go in towards each other. Make sense? Yes. Great. Next move is for carpal tunnel. So as we know with the carpal you can go in the front if you want. As you know with the carpal <laughs> tunnel, if the lunate is involved, typically we need to go A to P. Right? That's our most common. So we know we can just, what we just learned, you can go A to P, but there's another way you can do that as well. So it's going to be almost like you're shaking hands with your patient, not exactly, but your index finger, not your powder index, your actual index, is you're going to push onto the volar surface of that lunate, okay? So you don't need to actually like put your hands together like that, but that kind of idea. And then you can just rest this right here if you want, okay? And then with my lateral hand, I'm going to go over the proximal row with that web contact, <laughs> like so, okay? And that should, if we go above for a moment, should look like so, okay? So this is pushing AP onto the lunate, and this is covering up over that proximal row. There. 
Okay? So again, this is more of an impulse. We're not lifting up and smacking down. So we're going to push A to P on that lunate. Reinforce that proximal row. Distract. And then thrust. Okay? And by kind of squeezing that proximal row, it's effective, and I'm pushing that uh, lunate anterior to posterior. It's effectually effective. Okay. Effectively, <laughs> not affectionately. <okay? laughs> Effectively deepening that carpal tunnel. Okay. Last thing I'm going to show you is just some Palmer soft tissue work that your patients typically love. And then Dr. Shimano will take the rest. I'll have you sit down. <laughs> so people very often work with our hands, right? We're a profession that works with our hands a lot. Construction workers, massage therapists. <laughs> So we have pain often in our hands, right? And we have that palmar fascia that we might want to work out. So what we can do is, sorry, um, I'm going to take my pinkies and then I'm going to go between her fourth and fifth fingers and her first and second, like so, okay? So like that, can you kind of see? Then I'm going to kind of open up that hand. So I'm pushing that open. Thank you. So I'm coming in like this. Okay? Not like this. I'm opening it. And then I'm going to take my fingers. The lighting is a bit tough. Yeah. I'm going to take my fingers and I'm just going to spread apart that fascia. And it feels very nice. Okay? So people will appreciate it. If you just work in that area. Okay, so it's not an adjustment, but just a nice little move for you. Okay? But you have to have their hands open up. It can't be in that opposed position. Ready? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So oh, I was cool. told you guys saw this already, kind of as a mobilization, generalized mobilization. Yeah, first lap, not that. Oh, first lap, not this lap. Oh, okay, got it. So <clears throat> you guys haven't seen this at all. There is a way to mobilize the intercarpal joints, aside from this grip that you guys are familiar with here, kind of. Uh, distracting and then you can go in various directions. There's a generalized mobilization associated with this as well that I kind of like to do because it involves that distracted development. Using the patient's own humerus as sort of that block or that stop, I can come in around here sitting next to the patient, block their humerus, my humerus, and then I can sort of interdigitate here around sort of grabbing that distal row of carpals here and then by keeping them stable here, I can distract and I can kind of generally mobilize that intercarpal joint space, the space between the two rows of carpal bone. <coughs> very, very effective for that, right? To try to mobilize that space in various directions. What, <laughs> what I can also do with this, and what I adapt this particular procedure for, is to do either an A to P or a P to A glide of a particular carpal bone in a neutral position. It's not really too great for radio ulnar. I only recommend doing it in neutral while the wrist is neutral, okay? So I can still kind of interdigitate, but now let's say I wanted to go P to A for my thrust. Well, then now my hand that's lateral to the patient is going to be pushing P to A with my piezoform on whichever one of the carpal bones I want to isolate, okay? And so let's say for the sake of uh, ease, I'm going to use the lunate. If I wanted to isolate P to A glide on the lunate, I'm going to place my piezoform right over that lunate, still kind of interdigitate around the patient's fingers, but now as I distract, I get a huge gapping effect here, and then I can push P to A with that lunate to move that. So with that thrust, it's a combination of me sort of extending my own elbows to distract and thrusting by going into a little bit of wrist extension here with that piezoform in that position to create that impulse thrust, okay? I can also do the same thing for A to P glide. If I identify the lunate, hypophenar right on that structure, interdigitate around there, so now I can isolate, keep the wrist neutral, distract, and then now extend my medial hand here and drive my piezoform <laughs> into that lunate as well. It's a very, very quick impulse thrust here, 
and uh, the distract development on it is huge. So it really gaps the joints and it makes it very easy to move either A to P or P to A with that. So it's really, really effective. You can do this seated or standing if there's a big height discrepancy with the patient. So you can be in any position and go through any one of the particular carpals as long as you can identify it ahead of time and isolate your positive form on. Okay? So give those a shot as well. Thank you. Okay? That's it. Practice and then you're free to go. Thank you.